Hello, welcome to the 1874 show. I'm your host, Dan Bardell, joined by the Athletics' Greg Evans to chew through the latest Aston Villa football club fat. Greg, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Dan. I've had two go- uh, two days golfing, so haven't done much work this week, so I'm feeling good and refreshed. Not, not like you to go and play golf, Greg. Any, anyone we know you were playing with? Or got to keep your sources uh, close to your chest? No, just uh, not very interesting people. Oh, well, uh, interesting people for me, but not for this podcast. Not for the podcast. No Villa personnel on the golf course with Global Greg Evans. Some little admin to start. If you're listening to this via audio, it's going to mean absolutely nothing to you. But I've been battling with Adam to try and get rid of the 1874 show in the middle of the screen if you're watching via YouTube. I've not won that battle but I have got him to make it a little bit smaller. So if you don't like having a big, massive 1874 in the middle of the screen, make sure you let him know in the live comments so he knows that you want it gone. I have told him, but he won't listen to me. Greg, we're back. We missed a week last week. Our our schedules would not align at all last week, but another three points for Aston Villa and another clean sheet at home as well. And it feels like, We said about that momentum away from home. It now feels like the club's got that momentum at home now as well. It's going all right, isn't it? Unusual. I I almost don't like it. You don't like it? All these years you've been moaning at me. I'm uncomfortable. Now you're you're saying you don't like it. I'm uncomfortable with that I think we might be on the right track finally. We've we've had the right owners for a long time, but now I feel like we actually might, might all be coming together and that we are on the right track. And that does concern me a bit because Villa have burnt me before many times in my life. Look, the momentum's there, isn't it? I think Villa are on the right track now, and um, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what happens going forward. I, I think that I think that Villa are in a really good place, and I think that they've they've found a way to win games against some of the lower ranked teams in the division. And it'd just be interesting to see how they get on against some of the better teams now, because that's the big t- that's the big challenge, isn't it? You know, Villa have struggled to um, you know to, to beat the better teams, uh, and that's what they're going to start having to, having to do. Yeah, in their defence, they've done it a couple of times under Unai Emery, beating Manchester United and beating Spurs away as as well. So, we haven't played one of the big boys for a while. I guess technically next game, Chelsea, even though they're not doing great, is, is a test. Going to Stamford Bridge, it'll be interesting how, how Villa line up and how, and how they do there. But Greg, is Unai Emery the real deal? Now, I can't remember when you started covering Villa, so remind me and remind everyone who listens to the podcast. When did you start covering Villa? Greg seems to have unplugged himself, which is not great for a, for a podcast. I've lost Greg. I'm on my own. Excellent. We're doing 1874 live and I'm on my own. Is he coming back? Apologies for these technical difficulties. Chris Taya in the comments is asking me to give Adam a break. Despite the fact that how it may come across, I am only messing around. Adam knows that I love him very much. I'd love him even more if he could get Greg back on the screen for me. I'm absolutely sweating here, hoping that he'll come back because I do not want to do a whole podcast on my own. What I was going to say to Greg before he went is that Unai Emery, to me now, it does feel like Villa have the right manager. I've thought this before, but with Unai Emery, He's a top-class manager, and I am starting to get excited now because things are changing. It feels like the club's heading in a certain direction now. And to me, it's the best I've felt as a Villa fan for a long, long time. So let me know in the comments if you're feeling the same because I'm going to have to have a chat with the people in the comments because there's nobody else here now for me to talk to. Danu Villa is telling Greg to turn his volume up. Well, it'd be nice if he was on on, on the screen. It'd be nice if the ac 74 wasn't covering my face as well. Adam... Absolute shambles on the, on the Villa View. Rest in peace, Greg. Yep, not here. Thank you, Adam, for finally removing that big giant logo from my face. Whilst I'm waiting for Greg, you might as well ask me some questions because I'm stuck here waiting for him to come back. I can see WhatsApp is absolutely flying between Greg and Adam, so hopefully he'll be coming back on the screen shortly. So, yeah, ask me some questions, please, because I'm going to need something to talk about for the next five, ten minutes whilst we try and get... Greg back, really been distracted by WhatsApp and my TV has turned on downstairs as well, which is also proving quite distracting for me. Really could do with some some questions. I'm going to go to Michael Huggins, who said, I've been a Villa fan since the mid 70s and I can confidently say that Emery will bring those feelings I have in the early 80s. Well, despite how I may look, I was only born in 85, so I don't remember what it was like supporting Aston Villa in, in those times. But obviously, if you've won a European Cup and you've won the league, it's a very, very good time. Ad saying he can easily see Unai being here for a decade or more. 
hopefully, you know, that's the dream, isn't it, to have a manager? I thought Dean Smith might be that manager that stayed with Villa for the long haul and the club progressed. Obviously, he was there for three-ish years in the end before he departed and then Villa decided to write off a year under Steven Gerrard. But I feel with Unai Emery at the moment that there is that buy-in. I do think that that he get, he gets it. He gets the club. Not quite in a way that, you know, sometimes when a manager comes in and they're a Villa fan or they've been associated with the club before and you say, yeah, they get it. They know what it takes to be at Villa. They know what the fans want. Unai Emery's not been associated with Villa, didn't play for Villa, hasn't been involved with Villa in any way before. But I do feel like he just gets it. And he's a, he is a top-class manager. I've seen all the stuff on Twitter in recent days with, with Miguel Delaney, who I've done a couple of bits and pieces with before in the past, getting a, a bit of stick. I don't think he's articulated it in the best way necessarily, but I do get what, what he's saying. Emery isn't an elite manager. He isn't up there with, with Pep Guardiola, who everyone knows is an elite manager. But he's the next level below from that, I would say. And there's no shame in that because Pep's absolutely outrageous as a football manager. But Villa having a manager at this stage with where we've been, particularly when I talk about the fact we completely lost a year under Steven Gerrard, for Villa to have picked up a manager of his calibre and to be sitting where they are where they are now, given the start that we had as, as well, you know, not only did we write off a year, we pretty much wrote off the first third of the season, really, under Steven Gerrard. But Unai Emery shown what a good manager he is because he's, put, he's pulling a squad together and pulling a team together and creating a team, harnessing an atmosphere without really bringing in any of any of his own players. Obviously, we've changed left back with Moreno coming in, and I was very impressed with him at, at the weekend. You've got Duran, who was one that was brought in by the club, also someone that he'd had his eye on in the past as well. You know, So we've only made those two signings in January, and to see the upturn that Villa have had in that short space of time, if you go right back to that first game, against Manchester United. It was very early days. I think he'd been in less than a week, took less than a week's worth of training sessions. Unai Emery, we put in such a good performance against Manchester United that day. Got a monkey off our back in beating them at home, something that no manager had been able to do since Brian Little. But we outplayed them. And yes, they had Ronaldo up front. He was doing nothing at the time. But, you know, Manchester United were in a decent place at that point. They'd been winning a lot of a lot of games. They'd, they'd just started to turn the corner, really, and they'd been going well. And we dispatched them with, with a technical game plan and took them by surprise. And this way Emery has a set up on and off the board, I just absolutely, absolutely love it. And Greg Evans, after I've padded for 10 minutes, what happened, Greg? Please talk me through what happened. I've been padding the lot was... this podcast. <laughs> I was just talking to myself, thinking thinking that the issue was you and that you, that your internet had ca- caved in or something. But um, I ran next door, asked my missus what the hell was going on, and her TV screen had, crap, had um, gone off as well. So we've lost well, the Wi-Fi in the house, you know. It's major issues here in the Evans house. What, but... what, are, we, what are we using, interestingly, now to, to, yeah, to well, do this? Look, you know, all these millions of people now that are listening to our podcast, we're, we're using Virgin Media. No, no, I mean, if you've got no Wi-Fi... How are you? How are you? Oh, I'm, I've connected through my phone now. Well, I tell you what, it's better than your internet, Greg, your phone. Is it? Uh, as well, yeah. Tethering through his phone seems to be superior to the Virgin Media internet. There, there are other broadband internet companies. Yeah. Yeah, you've got, to, got to make sure you say that. You've got to be careful nowadays what you say. All those years ago when you were last on the show, Greg, I can't remember what I just asked you. What did, what did I ask you? Um, you'd ask me if I was getting excited because you couldn't get excited for some reason. No, no I can. And I've managed to get myself even more excited whilst you were off the screen talking about how much I, I love Unai Emery. But when did you start covering Villa? I can't remember. Yeah, so... It was the, the back end of Paul Lambert's time, so the 2014-15 season, just when. Is um, that late? That, that's when I actually became a, a, a focusing day-to-day reporter on Villa. I was doing little bits and bobs beforehand, so um, you know I had a little bit of insight into how the club was working and, and um, uh, you know and, and how the team had been performing. But it was more of like a, a floating role before I was just covering all the Midlands club sort of uh, day here and there. Um, but yeah. It, Tim Sherwood was well. Paul Lambert and, and Tim Sherwood that that sort of time was my first season. So Villa have had they've had some decent managers in in that time, but they've also had some managers that didn't really do it, and that the Villa fans didn't really take to the level Unai Emery is at. It somehow even now feels ridiculous that we've managed to pull in someone of his pedigree, really. And and what he's done, what I was saying while you were you were not on the screen, what he's done with this group of players, considering where they were. You know, the, the st- when he came in, where they were un- under Gerard, the fact that you know he hasn't really massively improved the squad. He's brought Moreno, who's his own player, and then Duran, 
who's a, who's a one for the future, who was a club signing. Considering that, to be where Villa are now, looking up the table, you know, they've cemented at least finishing 11th now. I think I don't think Villa will finish any lower than that. To be looking up and to have a genuine chance of maybe looking to finish in the, in the top eight this season, from where he took us over, I think it's absolutely astounding. And to have changed so much as well, to have that style of play, to have created the buy-in from, from all the players as well and to have improved so many players in a short space of time because that was the thing under other managers we were saying well where's the improvement in the players players haven't got better nearly every player yeah. seemed better under Emery so to me it just we're very very fortunate to have Un- Unai Emery as, as Aston Villa manager and hopefully he'll be manager for a long time to come because I think the sky is the limit and I, and I am excited Greg yeah I mean look he's not perfect because Villa have bowed out of two cup competitions under under Una um, you know, we'll losing start to with the positive there, Greg. Geez. And 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 look, you know, Villa have got a long way to go still before they can say that they're one of the top teams in in the in the in the country. So let's start by saying that. But but what he's done in fourteen games for me, watching on and, and watching that team now and seeing the difference and seeing how confident the players are, it is pretty incredible. Um, I'm reserving judgment on him for a little bit longer because he needs to go and deliver it over the course of a season for me. Um, you know, Villa have to go really deep into a cup competition or, or get into Europe. If, if Villa finished seventh or eighth, even I think, you know, even though eighth wouldn't secure European football, um, you know, I think we can start getting really excited because it means that Unai Emery is the real deal. Um, I can understand why maybe people in the, in, in other media who have who have um, watched Emery for longer than I have um, are not getting too carried away now because he, he had a period at Arsenal where he didn't deliver. Um, he was manager of Paris Saint-Germain at a time where they had an incredible amount of money and he didn't deliver. Wasn't he statistically level. their most successful manager, Unai Emery, at PSG? I'm sure I've read that. Um, yeah, but I mean, he only won one league. I mean, he lost the league one of the years. So... Well, it's happened yeah. again since, hasn't it? I think Pochettino has, has had that where he didn't win the win the league. I mean, they're just a, a PSG. I don't think you can but fully look, judge look, a manager I'm, at I'm, PSG. I don't. I don't want it to, this to come across as negative because it certainly isn't. And what he's done at Villa is is, is very very impressive. But he he was asked himself right at the last press conference. Um, you know, only three teams have picked up more points than you since since you've uh, taken over. How do you feel about that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he was very quick to admit that, look, I've only been in charge for 13 games at that point because it was before the um, win over Bournemouth. And he said, a season's 38 games. You know, I know that better than it, better than all of you guys asking me the questions because I've done it for much longer. Um, and he knows that Villa, to be judged properly at Villa, he needs a full season or 38 games at least. And then let's see where they are. But what he's done is very impressive. It's clear that, He's a very, very good coach. He's got an excellent support team around him. Um, he's got all the, he's got everything he needs. Look, he's got the cars to the, uh, the keys to the car. We, we know that. So anything he wants, he needs. And the people that are still there working alongside him, he likes. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the summer, what, which players he brings in and, and, and whether that will help Villa. I know they're, they're very, very, very ambitious in some of the targets that they're looking at. They're really ready to push the boat out. You know, certainly that Emery wants this. Um, you know, he's he's very ambitious with with the players that he's looking at now. So uh, whether Villa are able to pull off those deals or not, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but it's exciting times and, and it's clear that there's a big improvement on before. But let's not forget when Steven Gerrard came in and, and I know it didn't work out for him and it wasn't as... Um, obvious the 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 step up from from Dean Smith to Steve, Stephen Gerrard at the time as it is from Stephen Gerrard to Unai Emery, and especially in terms of the points haul. But there was a little bit of excitement as well around Gerrard and what he was going to do in the early periods, and then it just fizzled out. So, um, you know, I've, I've I've been around long enough to to know that there's still a long way to go, but it's a very very good start and it's exciting. I'll take your point. I think when Gerard first came in, he stabilised Villa maybe for, for five games and they ran a couple of the big boys close, were a bit plucky, a couple of defeats by one goal to, to Man City and Liverpool. And you thought, OK, he's changed a few things here. They look decent. But him and Emery took over around the same time, if I remember. If I remember. Yeah, 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 At this point in 2022, Villa fans were bored. It and we were just downhill, pi- wasn't it? At this we point, were pining yeah. for, all, all I was hanging my hat on was, 
this summer. They talked about the summer. It's going to be a big summer for Aston Villa. Mm-hmm. Everyone at the club, that was all the sound bites coming out of it. I actually don't hear those kind of sound bites coming out from the club at the moment, even though I think, yeah, again, it is another big summer. But if you look at this at this point, players were starting to go downhill. They were, the form was, was, was a struggle for, for a lot of players. There was maybe a Cash and Ramsey with the two that had improved, but no, no one else really you felt was was any better un, under the manager. And you were just hoping that he'd pick up a few of his own players in the summer and Villa would kick on the season after. The improvement in the players, you know, look at Ollie Watkins' goal output for, for one. He was getting nowhere near the, these numbers under, un, under Steven Gerrard. Emery's tangibly changed something with him. Matt Cash has come out of the team. Said he was struggling a little bit with what Emery wanted, but he's learned, he's come in, and now he looks like he's back to his best, albeit starting to play a slightly different role. The downturn in John McGinn under Steve and Gerrard compared to the upturn in John McGinn in Unai Emery, I think that alone just diminishes the argument of that just we were getting excited about Steve and Gerrard. Because I think at this point, we weren't. I was hanging my hat on nothing, really, at, at, at this point with Gerrard. I think there's a lot of things now that Villa fans can say. Yes, Unai Emery is, is, is going to be the right man. As long as he continues to get buy-in from the players, which is the most important thing, mm. I think we can finally say that I think Villa might be on the up, Greg. Oh, look, we, we can certainly say that. You know, there's, there's, that, there's no denying that. Villa are on the up. They've got a very, very good manager um, at the helm and, and somebody who's transformed the way they play made the players a lot more confident and believing in themselves. And crucially, they're getting results. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not sitting here saying that Villa aren't on the up. They are 100% on the up. But whether Unai Emery is going to be good enough to deliver the the, the type of um, finish that, that Villa fans are craving, you know, a, a top six or potentially in the future a top four, we just don't know at this stage. No, of course. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to wait and see on that. And I can't say that Unai Emery is this, you know, elite manager that's going to completely transform Villa because it is just too soon. But the the early signs are incredibly positive. And um, I think it, the thing now is if you you ask most Villa fans, there's not there's probably not a manager in the division, really, that they would swap for Unai Emery right now, as mad as that sounds. Certainly not a realistic they, proposition. Because they're really believing in him now. They're, they're buying into exactly what he wants to do. Um, you know the moans and groans from from the from the passing out from the back and um, um, and the slow patient build up play are, are slowly going. Well, well they're in fact, quite quickly going away now. There's mm. a real buy in from from Villa Park. Of course, there are the few odd murmurs here and there, but sometimes football fans just need to be educated a little bit and told what the manager is trying to do because that you know for years Villa haven't seen a manager um, or a team play like this. So. They just need to understand what's going on. And a lot of the players that I speak to after the games now, that it was more so a few weeks ago. It's not so much now because the fans are very much on side. But they were saying, look, we need just a little bit of patience from the fans. We can hear them moaning a little bit when we're passing it sideways and we're passing it back and we're taking our time. But this is what the manager is asking us to do. And this is what we're trying to do. So if we can get the fans with us, why we try to do this, it's going to help us massively. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously sitting the whole thing, which is very, very vocal. I think there was probably only one passage of play in the last game where I felt there was a little, little bit of antsiness and a little bit of a little bit of moaning at the playing out fr- fr- from the back. But then five, five, ten seconds later, Villa had a Villa had a, had, had a big chance. Mings, I think it was, passed the ball backwards, and there was a, there was a few, a few yeah. groans, and then we ended up yeah. five, ten seconds Watkins later we were at the pitch. Chance, didn't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you know what we're doing is is working, and those groans are certainly a lot less than they were five, six games ago. But I guess that probably comes with the credibility of, of getting results. Villa had got good results and then they had those three games. I think that Leicester game was a huge, huge setback. And maybe at that point, that made Villa fans a, a little bit antsy because they got caught playing that way in that Leicester game. And it, that, was a, that was a poor defeat. But, you know, even since that three-game run where we lost three in a row, this, there seems to be a solidarity. It seems to have learned from those three games and taken something away from those three defeats. And Villa have been very solid since. And they're on this little unbeaten run now. I think it's 10, 10 points from 12. So they kind of had the first initial run when Emery came in. Maybe a little bit of a sticky patch over those over those three games in the middle. And now it feels like they've got some momentum again. And they're on that good run. So even the fact that he's kind of negotiated the, the sticky patch and they've come out of that the other side, I think that's really positive. Yeah, I think probably the biggest the biggest positive for me actually is the fact that he's doing it with such a, a small small amount of players. 
Um, okay, I think so... he might like that in some ways. A lot of managers, Mourinho has talked about it in the past, having a small squad you know, for everyone feeling involved. Yeah, I think um, no disrespect aimed at the players that are there currently. But I think if he had a small squad with the players that he really wants, then yes, he would like that. But he knows there are there are areas that he's looking at in the squad and, and the team even, where he knows that Villa are going to be active in the market in the summer and buying players to come straight into that team. So I think he, he quite likes the fact that there's, there's a small group, but not necessarily likes it. He, he's just comfortable with that because he thinks that's all they need. I was really quite, I was quite pushing him on, on this at the last press conference. I wanted to know how he felt. Now, no manager is going to come out and say, oh, we, we should have done more business in January unless he wants an argument with the board. Um, so I said, look, do you, did you, do you have any regrets by not getting a few more players in on, on, um, uh, in the last in the last window, because you you're a man down every single week on the bench. You've got two goalkeepers. You've got two centre halves. One who can't play because he's not fit. You've got two fullbacks. One who's thirty seven. Um, you've got John Duran and you've got Bertrand Traore who, who hasn't played in the Premier League for over a year. So to me, I mean, that looks like a really weak bench. And he, his answer was just that. Well, we've got three players injured: Kamara, Dendonka, and Coutinho. So when they come back, the bench is going to look much stronger. And we're literally playing Sunday to Sunday or Saturday to Saturday. We've got five training days every single week. For 15 years, he's he's had to drill his team while playing in cup competitions in Europe every single week. Mm. It, it's literally the first time for 15 years that he's that he's, that he's coached Saturday to Saturday and had training time because because Villa are in Europe and they're out of both cup competitions. So he's just happy with the squad. You know, he's, he thinks the numbers are fine. And the results are showing that maybe they are. And I guess next season the ambitions will be grander. He wouldn't be happy with that that small squad. He he'll want to sprinkle he some of some of his own players in there because he wants to have a bigger squad next year because he wants to be in the Carabao Cup for longer and the FA Cup for longer. And they're not looking at you at next year, of course. But if they are, then of course they're going to have to get more players in. So. I mean, you know, Villa do get into Europe. You, you, you really, you, you're looking at probably needing seven or eight new players. Yeah, that's the bit that I mean. I, I honestly, I don't think Villa will get top seven, top eight that, that's required to get into Europe. I'd, I'd love to, to be wrong, and stretch, that, isn't it, it almost They're would too be far behind. It would almost be too soon in the journey as well to do it. I, I mean, think no, because I, I disagree with that. I think they would. They'd hundred percent take it if you got seven places. They'd hundred percent take it. Of course, I'd take it, it, but. But I mean, to get into Europe, I, I think it's they're in a hurry. You know, the, the, the owners well, been in a hurry for a long time. are in a hurry to to get to get this club motoring right up to the top of the table, um, and and getting seventh would be the first stepping stone. I suggest if Christian Perslow is hungry for Europe, he probably should have got rid of the last manager a little bit earlier <laughs> than he did. You can't be hungry for Europe and then keep a manager in, in a job for an extra few weeks that you know he's going to end up getting the sack eventually anyway. But that's a story for, for another day. What, what you say about Europe there, though, that interests me because you're saying if Villa qualify for Europe, so Villa finished top seven, top eight, because I, I yeah. think if certain things happen, you could end up getting in the conference league through that. You're saying Villa would then need to sign seven or eight players? No, they need to, if Villa if Villa get into if Villa finish seventh place and get to the Conference League or the Europa League, you know, even wilder dreams, then they're going to need seven or eight more players. So you might look at maybe bringing Cameron Archer and Aaron yeah. Ramsey or Tim okay. Boonen back. You know, you might get two or three there, but then you're going to need four or five new signings as well. Or if you want to be really strong, you're going to have to go and get six, seven, eight new signings because they are going to need that amount of players. They can't go into a, a European um, uh, competition with, with eight men on the bench, like they've got this now, it just can't happen. No, of so course, you need to get the you need to get the the injured players back. Um, start introducing some of the younger players in some of the cup competitions, and it might you know it'd be brilliant. It'd be imagine getting into the the the, the conference league, which okay, people laugh and joke about and say to me you know, a Mickey Mouse competition, but for a club that hasn't been in Europe for 12, 12 oh, years, you'd or be busy. Long it is. It, it, it's the fans love it, you know. They they sell out going to pre season friendlies in France, so they'll they'll happily go and uh, park up in a in a square somewhere in Bulgaria or whatever and, and drink drink for a couple of days. So the fans want it, the club wants it. It would need a big turnaround if if Villa got into Europe because they would need to reshape the squad. But they've got a lot of good young players out on loan, so that could help um, top it up a little bit. 
global Greg Evans off on a Thursday night to Moldova covering Aston Villa in the Europa Conference League. I can certainly, I can certainly picture that. That's one thing I can definitely picture. My, that, that, I almost think I, I wouldn't want to qualify for Europe and I'm probably going to get absolutely slated for this. Because then if you do have to bring in seven or eight players and you always have to, almost have to accelerate, you know when Villa got promoted, they, mm. they, they got almost got, they didn't get promoted too quickly, but they weren't ready for it. And then they then had to buy all these players from all over the place and try and get a squad together. And it was a difficult season. I'd almost rather not qualify for Europe, try and win a cup next season or finish in the European qualification through the league, but get to do it all a bit slower so that we only needed to bring in maybe three or four of Emery's players this summer and then supplement it with the youth players that, that are there as well and kind of do it in that way, a bit a bit like Newcastle. So they, they made signings in January to, to get themselves up and they moved themselves up the league. But they haven't done what everyone would have expected them to do. They haven't gone crazy. There's still players like, like long staff playing, playing for them every single week pretty much. But the manager's improved those players, so it, it's working. Almost think in some ways if they qualified for Champions League this season, it might be a little bit too early for them. Just, just see what I'm saying. I'd almost well, rather totally it was done orga- totally organically. This season yeah, will be too yeah. soon, I think. Dan, look, you know as well as I do, just football just doesn't work like that. Villa have been Villa are in a hurry to, to to be a very good, strong side again and in the real top echelons of the league. And there's just no... The, the, you can't plan it the, the no, way you exactly not. want it. It just doesn't happen like that. If, I still think it's a massive ask. Yeah, I do too. I, I don't think it's going to happen. How many games are left? 11, is it? 10, 11. Oh, I've got 10. the table in front of me. Okay, well, um, one of us should know, know the, answer that question. The, they're going to be. There's not much room for error, is there? No, of course not. So it's going to be very difficult to continue this run. And if they do, we're looking at an incredible, incredible end to the season and and um, points all from Unai Emery. Because if you if you've got 26 points from 14, I mean. <laughs> If, if there's 11 games left, I'm, I'm sorry for not knowing. This is so basic. but We've played um, 27, there's 11 games left. Yeah, 11 games. So, I mean, uh, Villa, you're looking, you've got to win eight, I think, to get into the seventh, at least. I'd say. So, we've won eight of 14 under Emery so far. Yeah, you've got to win eight out of the next 11. But the, the, the good thing is, got Chelsea, got Brentford, got Brighton. Those are the games that you're going to have to go and win. But Still got Fulham to play at home as well, haven't they? Fulham as well. I do think Fulham might slip away. Not too yeah. confident about them being there. I could see Villa, you know, really sticky catching them. But with with Brighton, I just think Brighton, is, you, know, you know, they're playing well, aren't they? Yeah, that, that, you know, they they deserve it, Brighton, for the way they've been run over the years and, and what they've done. I think Brighton would, I think most football fans would take the hat off to them and say, "Well done, Brighton! Fantastic mm. what what they've come from and what they've done just by the what, the model that they've used is so mm. so clever and so innovative." I think most the, people the position, would congratulate yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know they're a good story, aren't they? And they sell the best players, but they they back themselves to um, to to bring in better players to to replace them, which is you know incredible. It's so hard to do, but the season that Brighton are having, the position that they're in in the league, the fact that they're in an FA Cup semi final, that's where Villa want to be next year. You know, yeah, of course, want to yeah. be late in those cup competitions. Yeah, some interesting. Co- Stevenage isn't on. You know, it's no, it's not. Again. No, that was a that, you're right. That what you said at the start that was a blot on his copybook. But I, I feel at, the, at that time we haven't quite got the the momentum. I don't think the players are quite bought into it as much as they have done now. At that point, it, it <coughs> no, feels different tough, now. If we played them now, we beat them. You play that game again, yeah. Villa would win yeah. that game, wouldn't they? With with the right team as well. But just look, I remember what he did at Villarreal. I mean, you know, he took over at Villarreal and. I think they lost one out of the first 15 games or something like that. So typically he does tend to have very good starts. He started quite well at Arsenal as well, didn't he? Faded away a little bit. Same at PSG. There was the horrible time at, at Barcelona when they had, had four goals. Um, they had four goal advantage and it, and it you know, capitulated. It's amazing, isn't it, to think that that was a Nuno Emery team because you just yeah, couldn't ever that. see that happening now. So now we, and probably you can understand when you think of he's been around for a long time as a manager. Um, you know, he's had very good success. At, uh, uh, he made Valencia the third best team in Spain, which is a, a tough job. And and if, if he can make Villa the fifth or sixth best team in England, Villa, a lot of Villa fans would be, be pleased, I think. Um, you know, Sevilla, he obviously had the excellent um, runs in the Europa League. Villa Real, incredible job, his previous job, um, you know, to get them into the semi-final. There's actually a story that I picked up on the, I found on The Athletic that was written by um, a colleague of mine. It was after the 
win over Bayern Munich. And it was it was all about the tactics that Emery used with his Villarreal team in the, in the quarterfinals of the Champions League and how they beat Bayern Munich over two legs. It was really interesting read. If, if anyone sub- subscribes to the Athletic, go and dig that one out and have a read. It's... Um, it reminds it just reminds us of what he's trying to do at Villa now. It's quite quite crazy, really. But he did so well at Villarreal to win the Europa League and then um, to go and win uh, to go and get into the Champions League semi final shows that you know he's a very very good manager. And for Villa to get him, um, he's very pleasing and he started well. And if he hadn't have had that Champions League run with Villarreal, he probably wouldn't be here now because he probably would have taken the Newcastle job potentially. That was one of the drivers that he didn't take the Newcastle job. Was I mean they were in trouble yeah. at the time? They were at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. but he I took mean, it, took on the Villa job. We were about seventeenth, weren't we, at the, at the time when he took the Villa job? But they had that Champions League football, and he didn't want to leave because he was. They were in the Champions League, and he'll have known all about Newcastle's grand plan. So if he hadn't have had that run, he actually might not be here now. Yeah, and there's a slightly deeper story to all that. You know, the fact that the the, the, the story got leaked um, so quickly, and and he didn't have time to tell people at Villarreal. That uh, you know that that he was in contention for that job. You never know; he might have fancied it if it, if it was organised a little bit better. So that's when Villa's um, the way Villa go and act about their business. That's you know that's why it shows how important it is that Villa often keep a lot of things private, and a lot of the um, a lot of the stories come out quite late. You know, there are people in the media that, including myself, who don't really know what's going on at various times when they're when they're putting in big important deals together. And that's so that they make sure that they get the people that they want into the football club because Newcastle's a, a, an example where it, where it went wrong, unfortunately. And I know there are a couple of Newcastle reporters who like to um, <laughs> who like to joke with Eddie Howe that that it was their leaks um, of the Unai Emery linked to um, Newcastle that allowed Eddie Howe to get to get the job himself. So they have a little bit of a, of a play up with him. <laughs> around press conferences, but look, you can't knock Eddie Howe, can you? But I think they're doing, I mean, doing a great job too. Both sets of fans are probably pretty happy at this point, Villa fans and, yeah. and Newcastle fans. It worked out well, it's worked out well for both, hasn't yeah. it? A club that, yeah. Clubs that have had a lot of animosity between them at, at times. Actually, I don't think Villa would swap Erno Emery in at the moment. I don't think the Newcastle fans would, would swap Eddie Howe as well because the progress they've made in a short space of time has been absolutely mind-blowing. He, he doesn't get enough credit. They've lost a few games recently. He's not getting enough credit for, for what he's done there. They were rooted at the bottom of the league, absolutely rank under Steve Bruce, and now they are you know got a good chance of getting top four. That's, that's absolutely marvellous for, for them and fair play to Eddie House. Some, some interesting comments. We've got one from MD saying the depth needed to sustain Europe can be a killer. Leicester couldn't handle it. But that was when they were in the Champions League. Wolves couldn't in the Europa League and West Ham to have had a dreadful season this this season in, in the Premier League, haven't they? But they're going well in the Europa Conference Conference League. Sorry, Rachel Insaw Lewis. If we got Europe this season, we couldn't sustain it going forward. We want sustained success not in it one year, then not in the next. That's kind of the point I think I was yeah, was trying to make. If they did yeah, it now, I'm not convinced point, they'd yeah. sustain it. No, I get Rachel's point as well. You know, in clip, it's the same as yours, Danny. You know, you, you you almost want to be ready. I get that. You almost want the club to have those real strong foundations to know that if you do get into Europe, this is just the start and there's not more of a risk of not getting in the following year. But I just think with football, it's just you just can't plan. You just can't plan like that. If you, if you go on an amazing run and finish in Europe, brilliant make the most of it, go and buy the right players and stay in it. The good thing about Villa is they've, <laughs> okay, they haven't quite hit the heights, the expected heights that, that some might have thought when um, when the owners took over and you know we hear about the grand plans every single year. But they've, they've done pretty much everything, haven't they? You know, they've got the club promoted, they've kept them in the league and they've kept them progressing um, or at least establishing themselves. And it's difficult you know, because so many other clubs are trying to, to do the same. And you just look at the infrastructure around the place now. I mean, I was at I was at the um, the the new inner city academy just across the road from from the stadium, and that's another eight million pound investment that the owners are putting in. You, you walk around Bodymore Heath now that they've got a state of the art performance centre where all the players, you know, love love being in. Um, the you know the facilities around the place are, are incredible. You've, you've got the North Stand uh, redevelopment that's you know in the process of. Uh, getting done. <coughs> We've had a question about that, that from Adam Wright. Is that is that slowed down? Yeah. What, what's going on well, with it's that? Not, it's not slowed down. You know, Villa are in a hurry to get it done, but they want the um, they want Witten train station to be to be redeveloped so that um, you know they because we we all know the problems at, at Witten 
train station at the moment. You know, fans are queuing up for too long after the games. Um, you know, they're constantly complaining to the club that that um, you know they're having to wait for, for so long for trains, and and it's just a bit of a shambles. And Christian Perslow is pushing hard. You know, alongside Andy Andy Street, the mayor of the West Midlands, to get this done. That that they've had some success, the government have had some success with with the Perry Bar train station redevelopment, and they want the same at Witten. Um, and speaking to Andy, uh, well, be, being on the same site as Andy Street last week, he said he's positive and and that um, you know they hope they can get it done. Christian Perslow wants it done as well. No, I mean I, I made a little bit of a joke about Perslow hanging out to Gerard too long at the start of the show. The stuff he's been involved in outside of the outside of the, the playing side of things, the development, trying to expand Villa Park and things like the train station. You know, he does put a lot a lot into that, and Villa have improved immeasurably off the pitch in fairness in his time there and he'll be heavily involved in all this stuff that's going on at the moment but you're right if it doesn't if they can't sort the the travel side of things there is no point expanding expanding the ground because you just make it even worse for the people that go everywhere it's so hard to get away from villa park whatever your mode of transport yeah exactly not you know that that train station's dated the fact that they want uh, villa want a really a, a nice fresh looking um, environment so when when supporters come in that you know that it's a nice modern look to the stadium um villa want to put a little um a, a tunnel that goes across the across the river that links the academy to the to the new north stand redevelopment so there's, there's work on that that's the next stage of it um and if you've been to man city uh, and seen how their academy is linked to the to the yes, that's amazing you know that's that's kind of what what Villa are looking at in, but with their own twist on it, of course. Any theme parks? Warn you, Dan, because I'm having problems. <laughs> no, no theme parks. No theme parks. Because I've been having problems with my Wi-Fi. And my, um, uh, my phone battery is now dying. So uh, let's hope that that um, that my hotspot continues. <laughs> if I cut out, <laughs> I'll have to um, go and get charged up. I'm sorry about this. You're so well, if, you, if you cut out, we go. We go in. I think I'll pad for an extra five, ten minutes at the end, and, we, and we'll go. Um, unbelievable. For those that have joined late, Greg hasn't paid his Wi-Fi bill, so he's having to. He's having to come on via hotspot the on his phone. Go off in a minute. Yeah, and, and the audio is is very in and out at the moment. We're trying to make the best of it. I actually think we're having a, annoyingly. I think we're actually having a really good chat as well about about Unai Emery, about the infrastructure at Villa Park now as well. So it's pretty frustrating, the Greg, that you chose this week not to pay your bill. I trying to talk about your jinxing of Ollie Watkins and Tyro Mings last week where you wrote an article Annoying. saying Annoying. they should be in the England squad. And neither of them were in the England squad. Yeah, I mean, look, more, more so annoying for, for, Ollie, for Ollie Watkins, I think, because I don't know what more he could have done to deserve it, to, to be in. I mean, Both. yeah, it was a toss-up between him and um, even Tony. Uh, you know, they both had very, very... Uh, very good seasons, especially after the World Cup. So I can understand Gareth Southgate's thinking by choosing Tony, but I just did feel sorry for Watkins more than Mings because um, I thought Watkins really deserved it. I think Mings has had a good um, a, a good few months. I think he's been very good after since the World Cup. And if Villa were look, uh, if England were looking for a defender, um, you know, with Harry Maguire not playing, and, and obviously Gehi gets in now. Harry Dyer. Didn't get in. Um, I just thought if you're looking for an informed defender, then Tyron Mings is, is somebody you could have gone for because he hasn't really let Villa down over the last few months. Um, but no, not to be, sadly, for either of them. I mean, the Watkins one, I can, I can kind of understand because I think Ivan Tony probably should have gone to the World Cup with hindsight. He's been consistent throughout the whole season, Ivan Tony. He's been at a great level this season. Watkins has obviously had a good month or two. So I can I can almost understand that one a, a little bit a little bit more. The Mings one baffles me because you've got Eric Dyer's a similar age to Tyrone Mings, I'm, mm. I think. What is there, is Eric Dyer's form scintillating through through the roof at the moment? He's a top and keeping loads of loads of clean sheets. I mean, Mings has never let England down either. That's the, that. That's the other thing. To me, he's the perfect man to have. If, if you're not playing him, but he's in the perfect backup. He's left-footed. He's got a lot going for him in, ter- in terms of England. Gay is not having a particularly good time of it at Crystal Palace either. Maguire is obviously not playing for Manchester United, but I think everyone's just given up with that. You know, he did well in the World Cup despite not playing. So I think you just have to accept he's one of Southgate's favourites. But Eric Dyer getting chosen over Tyro Mings, I'm absolutely not having that at all. That absolutely makes my mind boggle. Yeah, I, I have this conversation with my boss actually, and we've we've had the Eric Dyer. Um, he spurs, isn't he? Your boss, conversation yeah. for 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 a while, yeah. And look, I, I just personally think Tyrone Mings is a better player than Eric Dyer. I mean, 
Um, you know, other people might have that, that might have a different opinion, but that's my agree. Yeah, I agree with you. Let's get some questions then before Greg's hotspot dies. What's your battery percentage? Just so I, I know how many how many to ask. Six percent going well. Well done, well done, Greg. We did have a, a good one, um, a good one on the Villa View Twitter that I've completely forgotten what it was. Let me just give me two seconds to try to try and find that. Um, oh yeah, new contracts. I spoke to you briefly before we, we started the show. Stato's asked about n- new contracts because the, Ollie Watkins, for example, in the summer he'll only have two years left on left on his contract. Now, I mean, we've we've got things wrong on contracts before. We did a show, whole show, we did half a show on Tyrone Mings' contract, saying he'd be looked at in the summer, and then he signed one five minutes later, but. You'd think Ollie Watkins would be in line for one second. Because Emery, you know, he wants to bring in his own striker in, I, Emery. We know that. But Watkins is still going to be a big part of Villa. So you'd think a new contract might be on the horizon for him. Yeah, I mean, you'd think so. If, if Villa want to keep him, if, they, if they've got considerations about cashing in on him, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard that yet. So we'll, we'll wait and see on that. Um, I, think it'd be, I think he deserves a new contract at some point. Um, presume it will be talked about at some stage. He's the only senior striker, in fairness. So, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> when he's not him. scoring, Villa, Villa typically aren't scoring other than last week. So, um, yeah, he, look, he, he's had a good season. He's, he's had a very good t- 2023 so far, um, and I think conversations will take place between tomorrow and the next year. Yeah, they I did well. myself enough there. <laughs> yeah, you should be okay. Though. They did. I'm just thinking, they did well to tie Douglas Louise up when they did. Because he wasn't yeah, really, he wasn't in the team, was he at the time? Gerard just didn't no, seem to want to pick him every week. They did well, well to tie think, that. You know, I think Gerard was perhaps looking at the fact that he could have gone in, in January and thinking, well, we need to have, um, you know, players who are who, who are going to you know, commit to the team and be ready. So, um, I think that's what he was looking at. I remember asking Stephen Gerrard on on the day before the transfer window, what you know, what's going to happen with with Douglas Louise, and he couldn't really answer it. He said, I don't know. Transfer deadline day tomorrow. Um, we quickly found out that Arsenal went for him and, and they had three bids rejected. So it could have easily gone the other way and, and Douglas Louise went. So I think very, very big credit to, to the to the club again and Christian Perslow and, and the owners who, who worked very hard on trying to get that deal secure. Um, you know, they, 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 they know uh, Douglas Louise's agent well uh, and have a good relationship with him. So they were able to, to tie Louise down on a deal. And, and I, think he, I think he's been brilliant the last few weeks, especially especially at the weekend. Um, I tweeted midway through the game that I, I thought I'd been a little bit unfair to him because I'd been saying that I thought Louise was playing better because of the influence of Bubakar Kamara. But actually, Louise is performing well in his own right and deserves the praise himself. He's almost stepped up even more, actually, in Kamara's yeah, absence, which is which is great to see. He's a he's a different player now. He's he passes forward more often. He he he's you know he's always sticking his foot in. He's got the most interceptions. For Villa, which you know, probably typical of a centre midfield that plays every game anyway. You know, he's going to be up with those high numbers, but um, he breaks up play well. He picks a pass out. Doesn't probably score as often as we we thought he might when he first signed. When he scored that, that those few really special goals early into his Villa career, um, but he's doing a good job for the team. I think Emery likes him. He scored at the weekend, of course. Poacher's goal as well, was getting himself into the box at the week. And McGinn seemed to be the one that sat a little bit more. And Louise was the one that was getting into, in, into the box. And dri- dri- he was just driving forward with the ball as well. I said on yeah. the show that we did on the Villa View on Sunday. Now, for years, I've just what I've thought, why has no Villa player ever pick up the ball in space? Yeah. Now, every player seems to have space when they pick, pick up the ball. And I guess that comes from Emery's yeah. method with the passing. Well, well, this is it. You know, Villa are taking their time at the back. And, and sometimes you might think, oh, come on, just, just get it moving. But... They take their time until they find the right space, and then you've got really, really strong a really strong runner with a lot Jacob Ramsey who can get on the ball and run into space. Emmy Buendia, you know, had a couple of opportunities. He, he set one up for Folly Watkins who missed. Still waiting for that first assist, Buendia, unfortunately. I actually um, didn't think he had a good game at the weekend, but he came no, alive in the last ten minutes. I thought, no, I thought he, he wasn't having his best game. He was giving the ball away quite a lot. A lot of bad things happened to him, didn't they? It just didn't, wasn't quite working for him. Um, but if you look at the expected assists for Buendia, he's the highest of, of any Villa player. So he does lay on good chances. Um, it's just the fact that some of his teammates haven't put them away, which is a little bit unfortunate. But no, Villa have got a couple of really strong runners in there. You know, McGinn can get on the ball and run with it. Douglas Louise showed at the weekend. Jacob Ramsey, we know, and Buendia, of course. Um, just like to see either Bailey or Trey already do a little bit more in, in, in these closing months of the season because it feels like a weak spot for Villa, doesn't it, that area at the moment. 
Yeah, Watkins is driving with the balls come on leaps and bounds as, as well in the, in the last month or so. I guess that comes with confidence, but he seems to be getting Villa up the, up the pitch more effectively than he was doing earlier on in the, in the season. Well, I think you're, you're right. I think when, it, when everyone's fit, there's maybe nine spaces that are, that are concrete with in terms of team selection at the moment, but that, this, it's crying out someone in that kind of right-hand side hybrid role at the moment where Bailey and... Bailey's been playing. Bailey, he did get an assist, didn't he? That the way he can start. My thing that I said a few weeks ago wasn't true, was it? Because I said if he starts the game well, (laughs) if he has a good early impact, he goes on has a really good game. But actually, he was quite. He didn't have a bad game, but he was still quite quiet even after that that assist, which he did well for. Actually, that assist it was a good assist. The more I think about it, I do feel a little bit sorry for him. Look, his performances haven't quite been at the level that that they should have been, but he's having to play a much different role under under Emery. You know, he can't. He can't go at his man unless Villa are fully set in their shape. So there are lots of times where he's thinking, can I go forward or can't? Oh, so he's one of the guys that probably still getting a little bit used to Emery and, and what he wants because he isn't quite as free as most wingers. Or, or, you know, he's not even a winger. He's not playing like a winger. Villa don't play with wingers. Um, you know, he, he's not one of these players that has the freedom that players in that position usually do. So um, just to just to, you know, Add that in as a little caveat because yeah, his performances haven't been that great, but he's asked he's been asked to do a lot defensively as well that you probably don't. Uh, you know, it's yeah. hard to know when because Emery Emery wants his side set perfectly for when they attack. If you watch Villa, they will never attack with more than three three or four players, never. And the only and, and Alex Moreno is the only one who gets forward in terms of a of a of a defensive sort of fullback or a defensive player. Although Conza nearly set up Mings for one, didn't he, in the, uh, in, the in the last few minutes, which was a bit of a, a weird, How Mings uh, didn't score. He said himself, yeah. didn't he, on Twitter, he's never going to score again. He just decided that he's never he's never going to score. It's been too long since a Villa centre-back has scored a header off a corner. Oh, my God. It's been well over a year now. How can no centre-back have scored a header from I a know, corner? but, like, you know, tradition, um, traditionally, when you look back, Mings and Conza have never been goal-scoring no, um, no. players. I Diego thought Conza was going to be at one point. Diego he Carlos. a little run. You know, could 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 potentially add in that area because he's got a bit of a history of of, of scoring from set pieces. But Mings and Cons are never really out anywhere. If you look at Villa, they've got a tiny tiny side. Of course. Other than Cons and Mings and Watkins, you know, they've got a very small side. And Emmy Wendy has won the most head scored the most headed goals for Villa. Over Great in the air, so. it's unbelievable in the air for his side. Emmy, Emmy Wendy. Mings though, he wins every header at the other end, six foot five yeah. or whatever he is. He didn't win anything in the, in the set pieces, set pieces the other way. It's really, really strange. I'd, I'd love him to score a goal. He'd have loved a goal against Bournemouth as well at the, the weekend. We better go, Greg. Think of that, yeah. yeah, we better go before your phone gives out. But yeah, okay. thank you to everyone who's, who's watched live. There's quite a few of you on at the moment. I've really enjoyed that, Greg. So it was a, a good conversation. I had a good time having that chat. Did not enjoy the five, ten minutes on my own while we were waiting for you to come back, but enjoyed the rest of the show. So thank you very much. Thank you to producer Adam as well, mainly for making the logo a little bit smaller. I did see Leighton Castle asking for the logo to be removed completely in the comments. We'll be back next week with another 1874. I don't know what we're going to talk about because there's no Villa games, but I'm sure we'll find something. We'll look forward to the Chelsea away game, I guess. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel with your post notifications on. And remember, we're not just on YouTube. We are everywhere else as well, including Apple and Spotify. So if that's the way you prefer to digest your content, you can do it that way instead of having to come on to YouTube. Yeah. That's it. We might do. We might pop on and do something later on in the week. I haven't really confirmed anything with the lads, but yeah, we'll probably come on and do something later on in the week. Again, thanks to Greg. Thanks to Adam. Thanks to you for listening and up the villa.